with all these differences, what makes a mammal a mammal? Ah, that is a very good question. There's a number, there's a number of different ways that we deal with that here. Uh, one of the ways is ancestry. We, we group mammals together based on various fossil ancestors that we look at. Uh, and so we use an ancestry model to define mammals. There's a few other things that we can characterize living mammals today with. Most mammals have hair. Um, giving birth to live young is out, but we can say uh, producing milk is something that uh, 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 mammals do today, all mammals do today. Um, from a point of view of an actual feature that joins all mammals together from the fossil record, three middle ear bones. Very, very weird, I know, but three little middle ear bones. That is one of the defining features of being a mammal. I read that in the New York Times <laughs> article. But so the females always lactate? Well, it, 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 it's, you've got to be careful with the term lactate. Lactation, um, uh, a duck bill platypus, for instance, doesn't actually have a nipple as such. I mean, they, yes, I suppose when you say lactate produce milk, that's true, but they have these, what they call these milk patches, and the milk just kind of seeps through these sort of patched areas, and you, uh, you, you, you the young sort of uh, uh, lap up the milk from, 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 from the skin and fur around there, but they don't actually produce milk through a nipple in the way that, that, that most percentile mammals do. Yeah, okay. All right. So my next question is my next question is what makes an animal extreme? <laughs> well, what makes an animal extreme? That's a great question. And one of the things that we're thinking about here is that we, we come up with what we what we consider to be rather normal in a mammal, being four legged, living on land and probably not particularly big, maybe the size of a beaver or a possum or, or a raccoon or something like that. And that, we, from the fossil record and from looking at all the different mammals in the world, we consider to be rather normal. And then compared to that, that sort of more ancestral sort of style of mammal, something like flying, that would be extreme, you know, swimming, living on life in the ocean, like a, like a manatee or like a, like a, a whale, that would be extreme. Um, gliding like a sugar glider, that would be obviously extreme. Um, something like laying eggs, like the duck-billed platypus, or, or, or having a, a poison venom spur on its back leg, also the duck-billed platypus. Those, that's rather unusual to be venomous uh, for a mammal. It's very, very weird. Um, to walk on two legs, which is what we do, that would be extreme as well. Most mammals, very few mammals walk on two legs, and, and no living mammals today walk in the way that we walk one leg in front of the other. A lot of people are not near this particular museum. They're not near the Museum of Natural History, the American Museum of Natural History, or they may not even be near a major museum. There's a lot of great interactive exhibits here to really get kids excited about learning about mammals, extreme mammals, animals, natural history. What do you do if you're not near, if you're not in a major cultural center, a major urban center, and you don't have a museum like this with lots of interactive exhibits? Well, I think the first thing that you can do, if you have access to the internet, is go to uh, www.amnh.org and go to our Extreme Mammals website. It has a, a whole load of cool, fun facts. If you have a webcam, there's a really cute little application where you can uh, see a mammal crawling across your screen. And there's all sorts of interesting information and graphics and photos. A lot of the text that we have in the show is actually reproduced online. And so we, 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 we feel that there's a very good online experience for people who can't make it to New York. The other other thing is, you know, once you've had a look at that, get, get curious, get interesting, go look online for, for, for some of the different fossil mammals that we highlight and find out a bit more about them. Uh, go to your local bookstore. There's wonderful uh, books about mammal evolution uh, for all different ages, from, from, from young children to grown-ups. Um, that's the best thing you can do. Last question, because I'm a geek. Um, I was just so reading. <laughs> really? <laughs> in, in, in paleoecology? Never. Um, the last question was, I was reading an article in the New Yorker about a series of diversity and diversifying and the idea that um, a lot of people have that Animals diversify uh, because of extreme circumstances, extreme need. Uh, and the article is suggesting that, in fact, it's actually extreme abundance that gives them the opportunity to diversify. I was wondering uh, your thoughts on that dichotomy and also if there are examples in the exhibit of animals from either side of that coin. Um, I would say that, 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 there's, that, that there's, no one, there's no one right or wrong answer here when it comes to the reasons why particular extreme uh, 
adaptations uh, occur, both in the, both in you know in the past and and what we see today. I think that uh, in some cases this idea of abundance might might make sense. In other cases, environmental degradation uh, might be a major factor, and animals uh, that uh, develop features over many many generations uh, that deal with that uh, long-term environmental degradation. Say the world is getting cooler and, and drier, or something like that. Um, I, I would say that in those cases, you know, animals that adapt to that uh, have a better chance of survival. So I think there's all sorts of different reasons uh, why animals evolve, and in some cases animals don't evolve. You get some cases of animals living a very long time. Uh, I, I mean, I say that the species living uh, many, many different generations uh, where you don't see a lot of change, and then suddenly you get very rapid change. So I, I think that we kind of deal with that in a number of different ways here. We present a number of different cases. We have uh, animals uh, in, in an environment uh, in the Arctic from 50 million years ago where it was very, very warm and uh, a, a, a relatively sort of easy to survive from a temperature point of view. Uh, there are animals living there today, but it's incredibly, uh, uh, it's an incredibly hostile environment. Uh, so, you know, when the world got cooler, obviously certain animals uh, would have moved away or died out in that warmer part of the world uh, and were replaced by animals better suited or animals that evolved features to deal with that cold environment. So I think abundance is, is only one sort of small part of it. Um, we, we don't deal with, that, deal with that abundance issue so directly. One of, the, one of the things we do deal with, though, is isolation. And, and uh, uh, where, where we see uh, mammals getting isolated on large islands or island continents or, 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 or isolated continents like South America, we see, um, we see incredible diversity and, and incredible uh, 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 differences in, in shape and form and function in those animals. What's your favorite part of the exhibit? Favorite part of the exhibit? Uh, I got two bits. Can I, am I allowed to? Sure. All right. I love the Indricotherium at the beginning. The, the, the largest land mammal that ever lived. I think it's awesome and just a really <laughs> spectacular example of how big animals can get. Uh, and I actually love the Ambulocetus. That's the walking whale uh, and a sort of beautiful example of what we call a transitional form. You know, uh, a creature that, uh, from a functional point of view, sort of sits somewhere between. Um, uh, uh, the whales, ancestors of whales that were four-legged animals on, on, that lived on the, lived, lived on the land and, and true whales today that swim. This was an animal that had all sorts of features, like red feet and rather sort of clumsy hind feet like, like a seal, uh, and, 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 but, but, but still had four legs and sort of spent some of the time probably on the ground. So it's a lovely example of, of one of those forms uh, and just a really cool reconstruction. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Not at all. You're welcome.